So let's uh, welcome our next talk, Professor Frank Smith from UCL. Thank you. This is on uh, aspects of uh, icing in shear flow. Um, we'll go through three items. First of all, background and pre-impact behavior and something on droplets and uh, ice growth. But the main focus is uh, aimed, meant to be on the melting of uh, wall ice as the last item. Yeah. Cool. Okay. <laughs> no, Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, collaborators uh, over many years in that list up here, and uh, thanks to the current PhD students as well, and um, thanks to various uh, supporters, but particularly the, the contact with Aerotech has been, uh, has been very um, inspiring. So as regards uh, motivation and uh, background, um, Ian has... Uh, set that up very nicely. Um, so we see, uh, we, we see here a uh, defective uh, super on the front of wings and so on. And um, they produce this ice, which can be uh, 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 dangerous for the um, aerodynamics, of course. Uh, some of these droplets freeze immediately on the front uh, at impact, others spread along the wing and change, effectively change the shape of the, of the wing or the fuselage. And similar events occur in uh, icing, but um, as Ian, Ian described, uh, and you see the, the uh, icing forming, ice is formed on, on the uh, blades here. And uh, again, that has a, a, a dangerous effect possibly. As regards the modeling of icing, the engineers do uh, a very good job. Um, there are many, so many parameters involved, droplet size, air temperature, and so on. And the ice can, itself can be very complex depending on various conditions. Very complex in terms of length scale, as you can see here. That's, that's in uh, centimeters, and there are obviously lots of subscales there. But despite all that complexity, Engineering or in industry models do very well under certain circumstances. So uh, what's shown here is a um, comparison between uh, an engineering code, Tragice 2, and experiments at NASA for the ice growth on the front of a, an aerofoil. Uh, this is over a range of temperatures, minus 6.6 .6 down to minus 16.6. And um, really the comparison is pretty close, or well, the agreement is, is quite close um, over, over that range. The, the solid lines are the code results and the uh, dash lines are the experimental results. Uh, there's, there's also um, interest more recently in uh, extending this to include uh, water layers, the effect of water layers which form on the aerofoil surface or on the engine surface. Um, and the Im impact due to droplets and solid bodies. These bodies can be uh, ice particles, for instance. Many, many of them are thin, and um, they, they impact either on a solid surface or a water-covered surface in particular. So we'd, we'd like to try to model that um, in terms of uh, mathematics. In this case, it's a droplet coming down, uh, I think in a vertical tunnel, but I'm not sure. It's coming, they're coming down about to splash into the, into the water layer. And uh, already uh, there, there's been interaction. The, the, this droplet started life up top as a spherical droplet. It's been heavily distorted before the impact. So lots of physical things going on here, droplet distortion, uh, different particles. And in some cases, if there's a water layer, you can get this skimming, skimming occurring. This is, this is a, an ice particle which has come in from the right and gouged out uh, a void or an, uh, an area of air and then uh, bounced, bounced along. And that will bounce along and perhaps freeze further downstream. 
Okay, so, so that sets the scene. It's a very complex area, many, many physical problems to be addressed. Um, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about pre impact behavior. Uh, this is work with um, PhD students and uh, some with Manish. Just briefly, um, this work is on modeling uh, a boundary layer traveling through, sorry, a boundary layer in which there's a particle trying to travel through uh, from uh, up from the free stream uh, into, uh, into the boundary layer, into the constant shear, uniform shear part at the bottom of the boundary layer, and perhaps it the, hit the wall. The work done here, this particular model is uh, purely inviscid. Um, the body is, sm is small in the sense it's uh, vertical dimensions are comparable with the boundary layer thickness, the shear, the shear layer thickness, and the horizontal scale is small compared with the boundary layer length. So those are the assumptions built into the, this model. And under certain, if the, body, if the body comes in with a vertically downstream, sorry, vertically downward um, velocity initially, then you get what you might expect. The body eventually hits the wall. That's this this blue curve showing that, um, but we can say what the time scale involved is. The red and the yellow lines give us asymptotes to just check on the um, accuracy. Alternatively though, with different initial conditions, the, the body can fly away. It can uh, start here, but, uh, but go out into the free stream. Again, as you might expect from different initial conditions, uh, there it goes flying away. Third possibility that we discovered, which is a bit of a surprise, at least to us, is that the, the body can bounce repeatedly. Uh, so in this particular example, depending on conditions, the, the, the part goes uh, way up into the boundary layer and then comes back down as if heading to, for a, an impact with the ground. Uh, but it doesn't quite get, get there. Some new physics comes into play and uh, that sets the body off on another excursion up the boundary and down again. And, and again, new physics, etc. And this goes on repeatedly. So this was quite a surprise. There's no gravity in this model. Um, it's, it's simply uh, nonlinear, unsteady dynamics. Uh, more recently, we've been, we've been starting to model um, the effect of having a water layer here. So it's the same problem, a sort of boundary layer airflow coming along with reduced equations in the air and then water flow with reduced equations in the water. And we've been looking at um, interacting body, air and water to see what happens. Um, the body might fly away again, as, we, as we've seen before. Uh, it, it may skim, it may hit the water and skim. If it does so, it, we, we reach this sort of situation here. Uh, again, it's uh, thin layer equations in the, in the air, air is included. Um, and um, we've still got to get results for this, for this uh, situation. Other alternatives are that the, the, uh, the body will hit the substrate and bounce out of the water, doing, doing, or, um, or it may just gently sink into the water and, and rest on the bottom. And in this section, I, I'll also mention very, very briefly, um, some work by uh, Nat Hellman or with Nat Hellman and uh, Manish. And this is on a, a droplet impacting on a textured surface, uh, as shown here with, uh, with um, uh, an, a lubricant inside the, within the texture. And this is showing these, the, what can happen to the splash jet um, after the impact has taken place. The majority of the droplet is over here on the, on the left. This is the, the splash jet traveling very fast to the to the right. Okay. Now onto onto something to do with um, actual ice growth. Um, in in this work, this, this is going back a bit. This is this is um, direct simulation, um, and we used a, a VOF method. Uh, so we had the Navier-Stokes equations there, including the um, the uh, thermal equation as written here, K there is, involves the Prandtl number, for example, but the rest is normal, uh, incompressible fluid uh, Navier-Stokes. And we allow freezing to take place 
uh, using the, the latent heat to, to drive the movement of the ice boundary. Um, so this is droplet impact. We also need to, to um, say where ice is going to form as this droplet comes in. Uh, so we, we, what we did as, as a model was to put a nucleation layer of, um, of tiny ice particles, ice crystals on the surface, the bottom surface. So this, this is showing the, uh, the simulation for the temperature. There's the droplet coming, coming in and uh, it's about to hit the water layer. That's the red stuff just there. This is showing the temperature distribution as the impact takes place. The, the, the thermals are very like the, the flow properties. Um, you can see a nice, nice splash taking place. Um, the, the setup had uh, the water droplet coming in at minus 10 degrees C. The um, water film itself was uh, just above zero, one, one degree C. And then we put uh, some ice crystals along the bottom to allow ice, ice to grow. And this is showing the ice growth as time goes on. Uh, it tends to, uh, tends to fill in the gaps between the crystals and then uh, become more and more uniform. Uh, after that, so, so, so guided by that, came on to a more analytical approach. This is some work with uh, John Elliott. Um, again, ice growth on a cold surface. Uh, the, the work is based on small time analysis like, like uh, uh, Wagner and others, but including the viscous and thermal effects um, very close to the, to the solid surface. So time less than naught, the droplets coming down with a, a unit speed, say, this is all inviscid, mostly inviscid, sorry, and um, onto a solid surface. But on that surface, we assume there's, a, there's a, an ice lamp already formed from previous um, impacts. So we're trying here to understand what happens to a single droplet as it, as it impacts and tries to negotiate or whatever it wants to do over that ice roughness. So for positive time, we have, um, we have the, the, the droplet going, sort of flattening down onto the wall. That's producing this effect. There's the main, the main uh, contact point, moving contact point. And uh, beyond the contact point, there's a splash jet, um, which is uh, over these scales stays thin. And air or void is in between the solid surface and the um, water, water air interface. So to handle the nucleation, we, we assumed uh, or hypothesized that ice would grow in this, this part of the process. So between the, the original impact point, the origin over here and the, uh, over here, and the uh, moving contact point, ice starts to grow. Just note in passing that um, in practice, the, the parameters of interest, such as Reynolds number, Froude number, and Weber number are all pretty large. The Prandtl number is uh, of order seven or more. The Stefan number covers a wide range. And um, yeah, th this is an example of the results we got. So the, the, um, what's shown here is the water surface, the contact points down here, and then it's one, two, three, four. So the, the, you can see the uh, contact point gradually moves uh, over, the, over the ice hump and gets successfully to the top, and then we'll, we'll go scoot over the, the leeward side. As that happens, the um, ice, start, ice is forming behind the um, contact point, as shown with these colored curves here, four different colored curves. That's for four different, um, uh, different cases of parameters. So the, the, for, the, for this single droplet, the, the, we can say how much ice forms on top of the existing, um, existing ice. Okay, from that then, this is, this is, so this is Wagner, Wagner theory, and it's all over a small time scale, but we can ex extrapolate um, extremely, maybe, maybe too far, and, and uh, predict what happens if you have many Im such impacts. And they're all doing the same sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and yes, what do we get? That, that takes us to this, um, that led to this comparison with experiments. 
So the, the prediction from the, 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 the Wagner theory, the Wagner theory is that we've just done is, is at small time, seconds at most, um, as the, the time scale shown here is in terms of minutes. What we're comparing is the prediction from, from this Wagner theory and extrapolated like mad, that's the, the, the line A, plotting roughness uh, against time. Um, and compared with the, the, the NASA experiments, which are these uh, symbols up here, and some engineering calculations, which are, which are these guys. So you can see that the, 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 the Wagner theory does remarkably well up to times of perhaps one minute or two minutes um, before uh, reality comes in and there's a, there's, a, there's a saturation of the ice height. Okay. And this brings me now to the, the, the fourth item, um, which is the final item on, on what can we do about um, melting or growing wall ice in, in a shear flow. Uh, so that the, the basic problem we're, we're tackling here is um, we've got a, a, wall, a, a, sol, a, a flat wall, which is warm and then cold. And we imagine the, the ice has been formed on the cold part of the surface. It's a hump or it's a step, some shape like that. And you can imagine it's, it's, it's as a result of, a, of a, an ice particle coming in and making its way, having made its way all to the, right to the surface and then, and then stuck. So this is the starting point. Uh, there's shear flow here, because we're at the bottom of the boundary layer. The, the boundary layer might be, say, that dashed line, edge of the boundary layer. And underneath it, there's a, there's a curved um, velocity profile and a free stream on top. Okay, and we're, and we're asking, will the ice grow or um, erode? Okay, so I think this is saying what I've said already. The, the wall is at the same temperature as the oncoming water, but underneath the ice, um, it's, it's uh, staying cold. This is always fixed uh, wall temperatures. Um, good, okay. So start, starting with the Navier-Stokes equations, uh, basically what we've seen before, but non-dimensional. There's a Reynolds number, there's the Prandtl number sigma, involved diffusion diffusion <laughs> on the unknown ice surface the boundary conditions um, are that it's, well, essentially it's, it's no slip essentially but allowing for the movement of the ice and the um and the creation creation of um extra water or less water uh on the ice we're assuming that the 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 um the, the melting temperature is, is maintained, minus one. Or oh, we're assuming the ice uh, is all at the temperature, at the freezing temperature, or melting temperature. Uh, there's a Stefan condition on heat transfer involving the um, latent heat. And this applies on the uh, ice surface, which is between some x naught and x1. x1 might be infinite for, for a step. Uh, on the fixed wall, the horizontal wall, um, yeah, it's, it's no slip and it's a prescribed temperature. This prescribed temperature is, um, corresponds to uh, having a warm wall upstream and cold wall underneath. And if, if we're talking about a hump, then it's cold underneath the hump and then it goes back to warm downstream. The factor, factor R that was uh, just here is the density ratio between ice and water. Uh, R star is about 0.92, I think. Um, in the working, actually, we're going to take R star to equal one, just, just as a first model. Uh, we've talked about C star. Um, and then there, there are far field conditions of matching with the flow in the far field, uh, a uniform stream, for example. The parameter values involved in Navier Stokes here are virtually the same as before. On Reynolds number, Prandtl number, and Stefan number. And what we're going to key on is the largeness of the Reynolds number in most applications. Um, so we're imagining the, ba the boundary layer flow is, is coming along, uh, but the ice lump we're looking at is small compared with the, the shear flow of the boundary layer. Small in the, in, the, in the sense of x lengths, 
and in terms of y heights. So uh, on the scale of the hump or the, or the step up, uh, we see the, the bottom of the boundary layer, which gives us this uniform shear flow here. The rest of the boundary layer is way, way up there. Um, there's the warm wall, there's the cold wall, x equals zero now is the start of the, of the uh, ice hump. And we're going to apply, we apply a, a local scaling of velocity, pressure, temperature, space and time. I'll leave out the details on that. What we get is um, a boundary layer system, uh, as shown here, full continuity, uh, full inertia, uh, pressure gradient, but the viscous term is, the diffusion term is dominated by dtu dy squared, because we've got a relatively small y scale compared with x. Likewise, in the uh, temperature equation, it's theta y y. Theta is the unknown temperature. And um, yeah, this parental number is there. And the pressure, pressure P is uh, independent of Y as, as usual in a thin layer approximation. The boundary conditions for this problem, well, in terms of velocity, it's U, tends, U goes like lambda Y. That's the oncoming shear uh, upstream and up, up top uh, of the basic boundary layer. Uh, there's no slip on the, um, on the flat surface y equals zero, no slip on the unknown ice surface y equals f, for not less than x less than one, but that one might be actually infinity. Uh, okay, and as regards to the temperature, uh, again, we can, there, there could be a, a, a y growth of the temperature in the surrounding boundary layer. That corresponds to the basic heat transfer phi, we were calling it phi, of the, of the on, uh, surrounding flow. Um, so that's that condition upstream and up top. Uh, the temperature is assumed to be gi given along the flat surface, but on the ice surface, it's minus one, the freezing temperature. And then finally, the, uh, we have the Stefan condition, that the, Stefan, the scaled Stefan number B times uh, the FDT, the rate of change of height is uh, driven by the um, temperature gradient at the ice surface. So it sort of makes sense if, if, the, if the theta dy is positive, then you have hotter fluid just above the ice. Uh, and that makes, with the minus sign, that makes F, that we're going to make F de decrease and vice versa. Uh, we can we can scale that factor b to be one just by because time appears only here the rest we're taking to be quasi steady uh, because the we're thinking that the the ice variation height variation is going to be relatively slow okay given function c is uh, well c takes us from w warm warm water upstream so that's um, theta is zero to uh, minus one on the ice. The far field is uh, UVP are like lambda y zero zero. That's fine, phi y for the temperature. Lambda has got to be positive because the fluid is coming left to right as we see it. And uh, phi could be positive or negative. That's the heat transfer. The boundary layer up top could be colder or warmer than the, the wall. Uh, yeah, quasi steady and oh and just to emphasize the point this this is a very basic case we we've thrown away or um, neglected many many potentially significant features such as kinetic underheating okay um, most of these things we've said I should say that the the, the non the boundary system we've got has got no upstream influence as long as the flow is going from left to right so we can march right up to the start of the hump um, very easily. And that makes the, the solving of the nonlinear system easier. Uh, on the other hand, in the temperature, there's algebraic decay as you, as you, go, as you go to large y. Um, so in, the, in this condition, theta is going like some multiple of y, but the next term is order one, that's fine. But then there's a y to minus one and a y to minus two term, et cetera, et cetera. That makes the, uh, 
calculate computation more difficult. So the first thing to do, we felt, was to look for an analytical solution for small disturbances to the far field flow. This corresponds to the shape F being relatively low. Um, so we get to say the, the uh, so F is H times F1, F1 is order one, H is small. Then we expect to get the, uh, the uniform shear flow plus order H disturbances and theta will be order one. This then gives us a linearized version of the equations, full continuity, and then the xy's momentum is <coughs> mu du dx becomes lambda y du dx, v du dy becomes v, v lambda, uh, and then there's the, rest, the rest is the same. And in the temperature equation, it's u d theta dx becomes lambda y d theta dx. The v term is negligible, and there, there we are. Okay, so, so that's a linearized system now. The boundary conditions are uh, virtually as we had before, uh, except that we can do a, uh, a Taylor expansion. So instead of having conditions on y equals, uh, y equals f, we've now got conditions on y equals zero. Here, 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 here. And then there's the, um, the Stefan condition at the bottom here is just the dt is minus d theta dy. Um, the time now has been has absorbed the factor b, Stefan number, but also the factor h uh, is, is absorbed uh, there, which, which is telling us that the, the, the evolution is going to be fast, fast when h is small, faster. We can get the solution of that system uh, using a Fourier transform, as shown here. So this is the uh, this gives us the the thermal solution here in terms of an airy function and uh, from that we can work out uh, the rate of change of f the fdt is given by rhs where rhs is this lot here and this lot involves a convolution expression as you might imagine from a free transform uh, and a few constants involved here 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 and um, also the the basic or the underlying um, heat transfer constant phi. So there's a competition here between uh, phi, the surrounding uh, heat transfer of the boundary, and the, the local heat transfer as here. Do we need to say anything else? Oh, uh, and then it's straightforward to integrate this in linearized problem in time. The shape F will be the initial shape you have plus um, this RHS term times time. So it's relatively simple. But there is the catch, a little catch, of course, that F must stay positive. If, if this predicts F to be negative, then we have to replace uh, the F by zero because the ice at that point has, has all gone. So in a sense, this is making it quasi nonlinear. Doesn't matter. Uh, okay. Um, and the, the hierarchy here is, is that the, the basic background flow is determined the coefficients of lambda and phi. Lambda is the wall shear stress and phi is the heat transfer. Um, these then determine the thermal response, uh, which then determines the shape, and then that would just determine the perturbation to the flow. So that there is, there's interaction between the, um, the flow and the temperature and the ice shape. Okay, uh, let's look first at some solutions for, um, for steps. This is the, the linear, linear case, just a reminder. So this, this first one is with zero background heat transfer. Um, we're plotting the ice shape against X for various times. So at time zero, um, it's this, this step up shape is a, it's a one minus an exponential. Um, and as time goes on, uh, yeah, we see erosion basically, the, the height of the step uh, goes down for, for all x gradually, the leading, leading edge of the, of the um, step moves to the right, or the erosion point moves to the, to the right all the way through, and that, that process continues. And the, the rate of erosion, of the erosion point moving, uh, increases, you can just see it's increasing with time. Okay, 
this is the same case, but with uh, uh, positive heat background heat transfer. So that the water up there is is hotter than than in this case. As you can imagine, that that makes the uh, erosion take place faster, uh, and it occurs at almost it takes place at almost twice the rate. Uh, going the other way, if we have colder water up top, phi, say phi is minus one, then um, well, the, the erosion point, leading erosion point, moves to the right, but much slower in increasing time. And uh, on top, we start to see growth, growth of the ice. So th this is a, a competition between the background um, heat transfer and the local heat transfer. The local heat transfer is winning down here, but the background is winning here. And then this, this uh, final case is um, when there's even colder water up top. And uh, then we have total uh, increase of the ice taking place. So at time equals naught, it's again the um, exponential shape. But uh, after that, the, the leading edge uh, goes up and the whole, the whole ice lump, ice step goes upwards. Okay, I'll just pause a little bit here to say that the model is um, it's very tentative at this step. That, that's, that's a vertical step introduced into a model which is linearized. So the linearization is bound to break down around the front of this step. Um, and in fact, on a, on a smaller length scale, there's likely to be an eddy forming. It'll be an eddy with a clockwise rotation. Separation will take place. And there'll be a stagnation point somewhere along this um, front face as, as the fluid coming along here rises above and then splat onto the front face. Uh, and then either side of that, of that stagnation point, there will be a couple of high shear positions and those are those are candidate positions for the the growth of a um, a prong. Um, what they what they call it? Um, a horn, a horn of ice uh, poking forward. Um, two two horns of ice poking forward um, here. However, that's that speculation. We don't know. We don't know that for sure. Uh, we then got, we went, then moved on to get some nonlinear solutions for for medium heights. Uh, so this is the, the full system. Um, we apply a Prandtl transposition, which is a normal thing to do for a boundary layer problem like this. It leaves the nonlinear system in equations intact. Um, the boundary conditions are virtually the same as before as well, but there's a slight shift. There's a lambda f there now, and the um, the boundary conditions become at y equals zero rather than y equals f. Makes it easier to solve numerically. And I'll show some results with the um, Prandtl number being five and uh, zero basic heat transfer. Okay, first of all, for steps, now two, two cases shown here, uh, black and red, the, the, the black case is H is 0 0.6, initial height is 0 0.6, that's that curve just there, and the other case is H is 1.2. Uh, 0 0.6, uh, you see the, the erosion taking place, as we might expect from linear theory, um, and, uh, and the leading edge is going rightwards all, all, the, all, all the way through. The, the arrow here is pointing out that, that uh, linear theory would give you, um, at time 0 0.6, it would give you the erosion point being just there. So it's, it's sort of an internal test on the, um, on the accuracy. Uh, for H is 1.2, um, it's a similar story, but it's more nonlinear. Uh, H is 1.2 takes us up there. And uh, again, there's erosion, total erosion, but it's at a much lower, lower rate. And, um, and there we are. Some of the parameters involved, uh, I think we've spoken about most of these, uh, except for this quantity A. Uh, the A is a, sm a smoothing region, minus 0.5, uh, 
between minus 0 0.5 and 0, we, we apply, instead of having uh, temperature theta zero all the way to the start of the ice, numerically, it's easier to, um, to have a smoothing region where we go from zero to minus one, from minus 0 0.5 to naught. We've, we've, we've run the case with A being minus 0 0.1 to naught, and it has virtually no effect on the results. So again, it's just a, a device. Okay, Th these are results for humps. Um, the, the, first of all, we looked at uh, a parabolic shape. That's one, two, three. Uh, H is 0 0.3, so it's a relatively low hump, and um, it erodes, and it will get to vanishing of the ice at a time of about 0 0.06. Uh, H is 0.6, um, it's a similar process, but the, uh, the erosion is at a time about 0.11. And then the highest nonlinear case we looked at for, for steps um, is h equals one, and the process is slower. I'm afraid I forgot to put the times on, but um, it's, it's a slower process. The, uh, the, the red lines here, or the ends of the red lines, indicate a little bit of an analysis we can do that predicts where the vanishing point is. Um, okay. The fourth case shown here is to check on um, the effects of the initial shape of the ice. So we put in a shape which has zero derivatives at uh, leading edge and trailing edge, and uh, march, marching forward in time. Quite soon you get into a, a shape which is essentially parabolic, and, and then you get the, um, the same sort of process as in these guys. That took us to a time of 0 0.08. Uh, I'm showing, showing here uh, the velocity profiles in the highest case, h equals one, um, showing that I've kept them all together. I'm not, I'm not showing them individually, just to make the point that um, at, small, at small times with h equals one, you've got a pretty, um, pretty blunt shape. And as you might expect, you see high shear on the front face of the hump as, as the flow comes towards it. And on the leeward side, there's a separation of the flow. This is this, this velocity profile here. I shear there, that was on front at early times. This one is uh, on, the, on the leeward side uh, at early times. After that, icing takes place, the hump gets smaller, and uh, you gradually go back to a uniform shear flow, that's this profile, plus um, not particularly large disturbances. Likewise, in the temperature profiles, there's uh, quite a big variation at first, but eventually you, you go back to um, the, uh, a simpler shape. Okay, there are certain further analyses you can do. You can show uh, that the, the, as time goes on, that the erosion point for steps increases like t cubed so it's quite fast fast movement of the um of the front uh large large stefan stefan number we took was five uh, typically seven seven to thirteen is perhaps more realistic but if, if you want to you can analyze large sigma and that gives you a, a multi-structure as the thermal layer is much thinner than the boundary layer uh, for any icing shapes um yeah, I've got something about me. For small, for small times, you can just check things out. Um, if, you, if you start with u naught v naught theta naught p naught f naught at time zero, then look for a small time expansion. Then very quickly, you can get to this result. Uh, you can predict the, the movement of the ice early on. Uh, so so that sort of looks like a regular expansion, but there is a non-uniformity at the front. Um, how is that? Uh, yeah, at the front you can see there's a, there's a bit of overtaking of term, of the second term over the first term, and uh, there's, a, there's a wee region at the front here with x is of order t to three quarters, y is of order t to the quarter, blah 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 blah. You get down to the full cyst, full theta equation holding, uh, but fortunately it has a, um, a similarity form which you can work out, and. Uh, so that the shape at early, early times and close to the leading edge goes like this. 
uh, as, the, as the X terms say, uh, uh, uniform slope, and then the X minus one third correction. Combining those two, you can predict the erosion point goes like um, X going like T to the three quarters for small times. So it's, so it's actually setting off with infinite speed. And then the, the, of interest also is the final behavior of the um, ice humps, for example. Um, the ice is disappearing, so we expect linearized theory to hold. We can make use of that to determine the theta and the, the, the temperature gradient, some function g of x uh, at late times. So we have the FTT being minus g of x. We can integrate that easily uh, to get f being linear in t. And the, uh, the vanishing point corresponds to the point when this g of x, as time goes on, it's moving upwards. It's, it's moving up, also, this, this effect is moving upwards with time and eventually cuts off the ice uh, at some sort of tangent point up here. For a parabola, the vanishing point is four sevenths. And that um, tends to agree with what we saw in the results earlier on. It's just, just beyond the midway point of the ice hump. And then the final behavior for, uh, for ice steps is, um, again, you can work out the asymptotes at large, large um, x. And uh, from that, you get the spreading downstream goes like x, x being like t to the cubed. Um, involving a constant a, which we, we can predict um, uh, exactly. Okay, well, it's, time's running out. I, uh, there's also been some work on uh, strongly nonlinear solutions. This is where the, the factor h is large, so the hump is starting to stick up well into the boundary layer. As you might imagine, surrounding boundary layer, what you might imagine then is that the response, the flow response is mostly inviscid, uh, but there's a thin boundary layer forming on top of the ice hump. And um, that's what all this stuff is going, is, is saying. Uh, the only point I'd just like to note is that the, the temperature profile in the inviscid solution uh, has got a nice succinct uh, square root form. And that, that verifies that the, um, the decay into, into uniform uh, temperature gradient is, is uh, algebraic. Okay, that's it then. Let's skip, skip that. Um, so that, that's it. Conclude. Just to just remind ourselves what we've seen. You've seen um, some pre-impact models for ice particles through an air boundary layer or through air and then into water. Um, some post-impact uh, accretion due to a droplet on a flat wall and uh, melting or accretion on in near wall flow so close close to a wall um that's still still going on with a, using a simple model um and there are lots of things that, that we think can follow on from from all this this material okay i'll finish there and thank you very much thank you very much for the wonderful talk is there any questions Thanks for your presentation. Um, how do your results of uh, falling droplet compare to Christoph uh, video analysis? Yep, yep very good point. Um, he's got some great results. Um, he, he, this, is, this is simply a model that, that neglects, um, neglects surface tension, for example, and uh, many other real life features. Um, yeah, yeah. It also neglects. There's, there should be flow separation in there. The the the, um, the splash jet is going to separate from the surface, and that that's not built in. Yeah. So it's just a very simple simple model. Yeah. He, he's got real life. Um, thank you, Frank. Nice presentation. Many interesting results, and I understand the uh, last part which took 30 minutes, uh, mm. it's uh, a new one and could be not published yet? That's right, yeah. Is it yeah. A, to be published? Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, my question about the 
uh, they say what you said at the end of 10 first 10 minutes of your talk <laughs> it's about the droplet in shear layer and you yeah. said there is the it's possible that the uh, droplet kind of come to the wall yeah. and then bounce from the wall and then again even without gravity you yes said, yeah so uh yeah i'm talking about the model not about what's happening in reality yeah. so um when the droplet come to the wall you mentioned something but very short that uh, actually there are no contact but the kind of it's bounce without contact yes. is it right what's happening in there uh, as i remember in your publication you especially investigated that stage impact stage could you say something more about that stage <laughs> this is a good question i just know there's, there's new physics in that region uh but what it is i can't remember no i would have to have to look at the paper or ask the phd student um she knows much more than i do about about that region um yeah, I guess I, uh, yeah, I think the, I think the excursion is um, ballistic. Okay, it's just, it's just thrown up, but somehow comes back down again. And the, um, the little regions where, where new physics comes into play is going back to the, the full system, full system comes back into play and set, sets the thing off again into a, the solution when it goes up like that is, is something very simple. There we are, <laughs> to be non-specific. <laughs> mm, yeah, good question. Mm. Can I just ask, with the Stefan problem that you were looking at at the end, where the temperature gradient reversed and you were starting to freeze and grow these objects, yeah. was the inflowing liquid actually super cool in that state? Uh, no, it's all warm. Oh, it's sorry. Um, Let's just go back. Uh, this sort of the, these cases, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's warm wall up to there, and then cold wall. The fluid coming along is um, is hot here, uh, but so it's five minus two. But the the so. That's the hot temperature, temperature zero. The, the um, yeah, the oncoming the temperature is, uh, is uh, decreases linearly with Y. So it is getting colder up top. So as a follow-up of that, do you know whether the solutions will be stable or not? Because often when you've got super growth into supercooled liquids, you have instability. Yeah, I don't know. I think this model is so simple that it glosses over a lot of instabilities. Yeah, yeah. So it's a good, a good quite, I, hadn't, I hadn't really thought about what the thermal profile looks like here, but yeah, it's, um, it's going to be at the warm temperature, and, but then goes up like minus 2y. So at some point up here, uh, the temperature is going to be the same as on the cold wall. Yeah, yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I just have a, a general question, which is maybe mm. not related to your talk. But uh, um, ice erosion, uh, is that similar to um, liquefaction by any chance? If, uh, is this the same kind of uh, mechanism? Uh, I, would you know? Uh, I wish I knew, and maybe others know. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about liquefaction, I'm afraid. Um, OK. Is it like related to melting or? Is it the same? It's just a more fancy word to say the same thing. Yeah, I, I, okay. I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Is there any questions? Oh. Um, if you have fresh ice or like seawater with salt in it, does it change things or only the freezing point or it's something else which changes too that's a there's some good questions here <laughs> that's another <laughs> another great one um don't haven't thought at all about that yeah yeah so i've been totally bugged into into this um stuff but that's that's an interesting point so um so you you imagine you're asking really if this was seawater coming along yeah. and this this was um 
pure, pure water or pure ice, what would happen then? Yeah, I guess we'd have to have a, as, as this melts, it'll set up another a, a, sea, a, a pure water layer. Um, yeah. There, ha there has been work by, uh, for instance, Papa Giorgio at Imperial College, I think has done work where um, he, has, he has ice which can melt, form a water layer, and then the oncoming boundary layer flow is, has got air in it. Um, so maybe that's, that's where the modeling would go, go for that. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. Any more questions? No? Okay, thank you. Uh, it's, yeah. I think it's coffee time. And uh, yeah, please come back uh, at quarter past 11. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. That's great. I'll, I'll do the last one. I'll do the next next one. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, great.